Professor Baum, could you begin by telling me your attitude to complementary and alternative medicine? Uh, the, it's very important to establish right from the outset that complementary and alternative mean different things. And these are also slippery words and are very much context dependent. To me, complementary is anything that complements my work as a clinician trying, in my case, to cure breast cancer. Anything that makes the patient feel better whilst I'm trying to cure them. And I have a lot of time for complementary medicine. I've, actively, I've been actively involved in developing some variants of complementary medicine. I, or art therapy is a particular passion of mine. Alternative medicine is that which is offered instead of scientific medicine. Now, I'm obviously against alternative medicine because to me, alternative, by definition, means it does not work. If it works, that we would use it. Right. So the moment somebody demonstrates that it really works, it ceases to be alternative and just becomes medicine. Then it's adopted as medicine. And uh, in my own subject, uh, there are examples of uh, herbal remedies which have been shown to be anti-cancer and have, over the time, um, decades of research and development been translated into effective pharmaceuticals, the vinca alkaloids from periwinkle, vinca, um, taxanes from uh, the yew tree. Uh, there is no conspiracy to deny patients proven remedies. That's a very interesting distinction. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Um, could we talk a bit about homeopathy? Because that's, some, I think, a very interesting um, test case mm. in that uh, the, the ultra dilution which they use, and they even say it gets more potent the more they, they dilute, on the face of it just sounds plain bonkers. And yet there are an awful lot of people who swear by it from anecdotal personal yes. experience. Perhaps you should get that out of the way first, the sort of anecdotal personal experience of people who think they've been healed by it. Yes, um, this is uh, a system of beliefs into the nature of evidence, which is very tough to shift. Um, and uh, I don't think it's actually my job to shift the public belief in anecdotal evidence. That's the responsibility of the profession. Uh, an anecdote really implies I had this problem, I did this, and the problem went away. And it worked for me. And that's very captivating for the individual. But from the, the point of a compassionate, caring medical practitioner, I have to say, is this the natural history of a self-limiting condition? It would have got better anyway, number one. Number two, is it a placebo effect? Uh, because you thought it was gonna make you feel better, it actually made you feel better. Or is that anecdote useful in that it might hint we have something active that's worth uh, exploring? So the anecdote may be sufficient, if there's sufficient anecdotes, sufficient to make us study something, but in itself is not evidence. It's equivalent to um, circumstantial evidence in court. If you're standing trial for a capital offence, um, you'd rather the quality of evidence was a little better than anecdote. And we accept that f for the judiciary. Well, many of the patients I'm treating are facing a life sentence. I want more than anecdotal circumstantial evidence yeah. for them. Mm -hmm. Well, suppose that we take the case where the anecdotal evidence suggests it might be worth testing and move on then to, the, to how we test it. Um, what, what would be the best way of, of testing whether something like homeopathy is valid? Well, the um, gold standard uh, for testing anything like this is the randomized controlled trial. But even before we get to that point, to do a randomized control trial means allocation of scarce resources, allocation of patients with illness, uh, allocation of uh, the time of doctors. So well, there are so many competing ideas um, in, in the marketplace of ideas to do clinical trials. We would usually like a little bit more than a series of anecdotes. We would like a plausible uh, explanation of why these things might work. 
Uh, no doubt we'll come back to that in a minute. But say there is some plausible hypothesis why therapy A is better than therapy B, then we would do a randomized control trial. We would first decide what is the outcome measure I'm looking at. Is it quality of life? Uh, does the patient feel better as a result of A versus B? Is it length of life? And of course it's easy to measure length of life and people ignore the fact that medical scientists such as myself are equally interested in measuring symptomatology, quality of life and we've developed the very psychometric instruments to measure these somewhat intangible but very important outcomes. So you would agree uh, on a diagnosis, diagnosis criteria, we are going to look at the management of asthma, say. We would agree how to define an asthmatic patient. We would then allocate the patients at random to remedy A and remedy B. Now, it's not always a placebo-controlled trial, because if we're dealing with a life-threatening illness, then uh, remedy A has to be the, or B, one or other has to be the gold standard against which you're testing the new approach. And it's double blind and the patient doesn't know what they're getting and the doctor evaluating the outcome of the trial doesn't know what they're getting. It is scrupulously honest and what many people don't understand about the scientific method is how scrupulously honest it is. We are not looking to constantly reinforce our prejudice. The opposite is the, tr the truth. We are actually putting at risk or hazard our pet belief systems. We're threatening our own belief systems. So this is an intellectually honest, intellectually modest approach to see is A effective and is A better than B or not. It's an excellent point. I mean, not only are you putting your, um, your own pet ideas at risk, even if you did want to cheat in some way, the double blind design prevents you from doing so. So it's, it's, it's not even possible to cheat, given that the, that the, that the randomized control dial is, trial is done um, su sufficiently carefully. If it's done carefully, and I've been involved right from the early days of randomized control trials in the 1970s, and the very first randomized control trial I organized for treatment of breast cancer, the random allocation was in sequences of envelopes. We thought, that's pretty blind, but no. We learned people were cheating. They were taking an envelope, holding it up to the light. Mm, I don't like that one, throwing it Amazing. away. And yes. so yes. The, if, yeah. if, if, if you can get round it, people will get round it. Yes. Not anymore, it's impossible. Yes. <laughs> that, is, that is very nice. Um, I've been talking to a, 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 pr a prominent um, homeopath who, who made the claim that there have been randomized control trials done which do show that homeopathy works uh, and even done uh, meta-analyses, I mean, yes. d doing statistical analyses of, of, of several different studies. And what, what's your view of those trials? Well, um, with all these things, you have to look at the totality of evidence. Uh, if you're looking for a huge effect, uh, you could argue you don't need randomized controlled trials. For example, penicillin was so obviously active that we didn't use randomized controlled trials, although it would have been better had we have done in retrospect. But most um, modern interventions, new interventions, were looking for quite modest effect. And you can either get a false positive result when there isn't really an effect, but the trials suggest there is, or false negative result when you're missing the effect that really is. And you, you therefore have to look at the totality of the evidence. Uh, if the totality of the evidence uh, says there is nothing here, then there is nothing here. And you have to be very careful of two things, accentuating the positive, being prejudiced and selecting the trials to overview that support your prejudice. And worse than that, there's publication bias, where you do a trial which fails to satisfy your prejudice, and you say, well, we won't publish it. And that happens. Now, as far as homeopathy is concerned, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, we know there's publication bias, and I have one personal experience where I know a negative trial was not published. 